you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, Long Street, Tamara here, your host and innovation enabler. So as you can probably hear, because it's so loud and the storm is so strong, I'm sitting here listening to the thunder. And I I love the rain. And I was just sitting here thinking about how much I love my work. Do you ever have those moments where you just feel lucky to find yourself where you are? Well, today's one of those days for me. So thank you. And I hope that you have one of those days too, if not right now, real soon. So I have a question for you listeners. Actually, I guess it's more of a request. I would love to know how you innovate. Actually, I'd love to know how that shows up in your work. So if you've taken our IQE, our Innovation Quotient Edge Assessment, and you know your two power triggers, I would love to know how it shows up for you. So if you're an inquisitive, I'd love an example of a moment where you ask those challenging questions that led to deeper layers of innovation. If you're a risk taker, I want to hear about that time that you, you know, raised your hand and spoke up and got uncomfortable and disagreed with the group, but that led to a stronger idea. If you're a tweaker, I want to find out how you took somebody else's work and made it even better, how you optimized it because you are so good at adjusting and editing things. Now, if you haven't taken the IQE and you don't know your archetype, you can go onto our website and you can go ahead and do it. I'd love to hear your stories. And if you're open to sharing your brilliance, shoot me an email at team at launchtree.com and let me know. I would be so honored to include you in my research and possibly in my upcoming book. That's right. There's a book coming. More on that later. Okay. This podcast is brought to you by Brility Digital, who applies strategic thinking to your company's growth objectives and then uses what they find to identify opportunities others miss in order to help you drive your company's growth. And they have a free digital assessment for Launch Street only. Go ahead and click on that link. It's in the newsletter. It's on the podcast webpage on our website. Highly recommend you go check it out. Now, today's guest, Greg Sattel, probably sounds familiar. That's because he was so insightful, we brought him back. This time to talk about how to create a movement and why that matters when you are trying to ignite change. As you know, today's world is more fluid, more connected than ever before. I think business is no longer a one-way communication with your customer, uh, just a transaction or a, or, and frankly, organizations are no longer as hierarchical as they used to be. Now things are more fluid. It's, it's a relationship. It's more of a living, breathing thing. And what you need to thrive in today's world is a movement. Advocates out there preaching your business, your brand your ideas. And with that in mind, we talked to Greg. Now, he's an entrepreneur, an author, a speaker, and an innovation advisor. And he's been published in the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Fast Company, The Times of London, Business Insider, and he has published several books. The one we had him on last time to talk about was Mapping Innovation. This time, it's Cascades, How to Create a Movement that Creates Transformational Change And that is the topic of today's interview. All right, let's do this. Greg, it is such a delight to have you back. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me again, Tamara. And just, you know, for the audience to know, Greg and I were going on and on and on. We're like 12 minutes in before we even hit record. So this is going to be a lively conversation. We clearly could talk a lot. So since we're, you know, still kind of getting to know each other, what's your first memory of being innovative? Well, I was the youngest of four very active and physical boys. So uh, I spent most of my uh, childhood trying to avoid getting beaten up. <laughs> so my first memory of, of, of being truly innovative was uh, being a pretty young kid and 
trying to figure out how I, I could play my older brothers off against each other. So they would beat each other up and, and leave me alone. <laughs> so that was, and that, and, and, and so you had to sort of think up a new tactic every day and, and the price for failure was pretty high. You know, it's so interesting to me. I think that people with, um, uh, a lot of siblings and by a lot, I mean more than one that in my world would be a lot of siblings. Um, always are so crafty in how they do things because it is a little tribe, isn't it? And you have to kind of fight for your way and be a little bit creative about how you do things. Yeah. You know, my daughter is a single, uh, is an only child. And on the one hand, I, uh, I, I really envy her because she has this sort of feeling of, security and right. uh and an absolute you know um absolute love around her uh that i wish i had when i was a child at the same time sometimes i'd like it if she was a little bit more competitive and had a little <laughs> bit more fire in her belly so i know well uh, you know there's benefits both ways and the single children that i know are also really crafty in how they entertain themselves because there's no one else to play with so you right. know, it, it right. goes away, but I do find that those that come from large tribes of families have very interesting stories of survival in one way or another. Um, so let's let's move over to your book, Cascades: How to Create a Movement that Drives Transformational Change. And as I was telling you offline, like it's a really not only is it interesting um, to read, but it also is very applicable, and you can really. I had a lot of aha moments as I was reading it. So let's let's start by talking about this whole premise about cascades and creating movements and driving change. Let, let's start there. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'd like to first go back to my first book, Mapping Innovation, uh, where I talked quite a bit about innovation is never a single event. It's always a process of discovery, engineering, and transformation. And so cascades really takes on that last bit of transformation. How do you get an idea to grow and spread? Uh, you can imagine going back to, let's say, the launch of the iPhone. Would the iPhone be nearly as successful if it didn't, if, if it wasn't uh, invented by Apple and Steve Jobs, if it didn't have those embedded networks of the Apple brand? that had been built for, for literally decades, it would have, would have been a much different type of product. It would have probably been successful, um, but it, it would have taken much, much longer to, to create that kind of impact. And I think that's the, uh, that's the challenge so many organizations have and people have, is that most of us don't have a brand like Apple. Uh, and we have ideas and we need to grow and scale those ideas and we need people to embrace them. And, uh, and that's why I wrote the book to help people do that. So I, I want to ask the maybe naive question, but just to put it on the context, what do you think is happening in business today that makes focusing on movements and creating these cascades, as you call them, um, so vital. And maybe it always has been. It's just been smaller now that we're all, you know, connected digitally. It's a little bit different. But it seems to me that there there's some important things going on that make this even more relevant than 20 years ago. Well, I do think we've switched from there's been a shift from hierarchies to networks. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because what do you mean by that? Your, so we just uh, we just are so much more connected right? And it's so much easier to build those connections. So where, you know, a generation ago, um, these large corporations could, uh, you know, could move a whole lot slower because they were so much more powerful. These days, uh, and, and I quote this several times in the book, power is easier to, 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 to get but harder to use or keep. So we're all constantly being worried about disruption and it's no longer feasible uh, to expect things to sort of go on at a linear pace. 
We are uh, even uh, one of my favorite examples of this is um, if if you look at IBM and the PC, right? They they went in uh, in uh, 1980. They realized that they had to do something drastic, so they set up a Skunk Works in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, far away from the IBM headquarters. And they invented the the PC in and launched it in less than a year, and it was a big major success. Today, IBM is at a similar point uh, with the end of Moore's Law, and one of their key strategies for um, for surviving the the next era of computing is a technology called quantum computing. But instead of going and and developing it in secret, uh, they've built a network of companies where there is active collaboration. Uh, and I talk about this in, in my book where they they uh, they partner with uh, uh, research institutions like uh, academic universities and national labs with their customers Um like J.P. Morgan and Samsung and Daimler, who are going to be end users of quantum computers, as well as startups. Uh, these are uh, companies uh, making uh, quantum tools and quantum software. So that's a polar opposite type of, of approach. On the, on the one hand, you're developing a product, you're launching it on the market. That was IBM in 1980. Today, it's you need to build an ecosystem and build a movement around your products and technology if you are uh, if you are going to be able to compete. And I think we're seeing this more and more in in more and more different in industries and technologies. So are you kind of saying basically that it's not necessarily the best who wins and not that you shouldn't be good? But it's that ability to tap a network or have a network that kind of, I mean, I can almost visualize it kind of spreading out that really determines success. Well, I think that hierarchies are slow and the world has become fast. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll get into this later. Um, these cascades, these vi this viral activity can erupt from anywhere. So if you're not plugged in to uh, – if you're not linked in to those relevant ecosystems or networks, you're going to miss it. And one of the examples I give in the book is the technology highway outside of Boston and Silicon Valley in, in, in of course, the Bay Area. A lot of people, people don't realize that Boston used to be the center of computer technology. Um, but they were very rigid and vertically integrated. And when the world changed, they missed it where, uh, Silicon Valley was always an ecosystem for various reasons that I talk about in the book. And that's what helped Silicon Valley, uh, adapt as technology, uh, changed. Will you give us an example of, um, I mean, Silicon Valley is great, but like a really kind of specific one of a cascade that happened. I want to take us through kind of the, maybe that kind of seminal moment to kind of the, the mass scale that it goes to. Well, I think a really good, simple example that I give in the book is lol cats. Remember those, those funny cat pictures that people were sending around? Of course um, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that just kind of exploded onto the scene. Um, and everybody, you know, it, it's like they weren't they weren't there and then they were everywhere. Uh, and if you look into the history of lol cats or LOL cats, what you'll find is that that trend or that meme was actually incubating on uh, uh, the 4chan community for something like 18 months. But because people in that community were connected uh, outside, uh, you know, they have friends and coworkers and uh, neighbors and everything else, um, 
it eventually, and the technical term is it percolated, meaning that the, all this kind of, you can think of almost a, a coffee pot, all of this kind of uh, brewing activity onto the, on the 4chan uh, community eventually spilled over. And that's how things go viral. So I, I think that is, um, I think that's a, a big part of what people miss about building a movement. They always start with something, you know, everybody who wants to create a revolution, they start with a march on Washington, right? Right, um, right. What they miss is that the original march on Washington with the civil rights movement, it didn't happen. It, that's not what made the civil rights movement powerful. The march on Washington happened because uh, because the civil rights movement had become powerful. And right. it was the result of literally decades of that link building and network building and connection building. Um, and that's what builds the movement. The, the march on Washington or the viral activity is that's part of the end game. That mm. is a symptom. It's not a cause. Well, I think what's powerful, too, about the, the both of those stories you just shared is what we ultimately see is that end game, the big explosion of it on the scene. What we don't see is all the connections that happened, those cascading moments that made it bigger and bigger. We see it at the end and we go, that came from nowhere. But we, we don't Absolutely. see everything that led up to it. And then – and then, uh, you know, when it when it eventually explodes, you have to ask, you know, are you ready to handle it or is it just going to spin out of control? Mm. How do you can you control that or is that out of your is that something that just right? Some things are out of your control and that's what happens. Um, you can control it. Absolutely. Um, or, or you can at least minimize your risks. Uh the the problem is that most people and in the book I call this concept surviving victory and it's a very very common thing I talk about in the book how we thought we had won in in Ukraine in 2004 and it turned out that we didn't same thing in Serbia where they failed in 1992 and failed in 96 and then eventually got it right uh, more recently the Arab Spring they got rid of Mubarak and uh, they ended up with Al-Sisi. And how many times do you see a startup, uh, you know, become the next big thing and then all of a sudden flame out? I yeah, mean, same, same with it, musicians too, right? They, that's why they become one hit wonders. Right. The one one hit wonder uh, phenomenon. I, I hadn't made that association, but you're absolutely right. Um so uh, so that is something – one of the insight I think most important insights in the book is that you need to plan on how you are going to survive victory from the beginning. Uh, so let's, let's back up for a second and talk about what surviving victory really is. So I get it when you talk about those grand geopolitical war up, uprising scenarios. And I even you know get it with one-hit wonders, right, where – you think you're on top of the game and then we never hear from you again. But but what is it what is really happening in that moment? Are we taking the wrong indicators of success? Are we resting on our success? Are we getting arrogance? Why is why does that happen to us? And then how do we overcome it? Well, generally speaking, um, when you're when you are uh, trying to succeed, Right. There's it's it's usually around either a person or a specific objective. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to make these sales or I want to be famous or whatever it is um, where those are very fleeting. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, ob what happens when you achieve that objective? What do you do then? Right. What happens when you become famous? Who are you then? Um, mm -hmm. The movements that endure are always about values, right? I mean, think about Steve Jobs. It wasn't ever about one particular product. It right. was always about his values, technology and design. Yep. Um, 
uh, you know, and, and you can think about Facebook now. Um, what's their biggest problem, right? Um, people don't feel that they share face, Facebook truly shares its, its values. Yeah, right. And that's becoming an enormous problem for them because it used to be where people felt that Facebook was really leading with values that they could acquire companies more easily and more cheaply than other companies. They could recruit the best and the brightest. Now they're having serious problems on both of those fronts mm -hmm. and eventually it's going to show up. Right. So, um, so I think that's what you, you know, that's how you overcome surviving victory. A, figuring out what your values are. And uh, again, as I, as I say in the book, values always have a cost, right? If they don't, if you're not willing to incur a cost, uh, you know, they're not really a value. Sometimes in our workshops, I ask uh, people, uh, uh, you know, what are your values? And they say, oh, well, you know, we value excellence. We value the customer. We, and then I ask, well, what do those values cost you? And you sort of see these blank stares around the room because um, if you're, it, it's easy to say we value the customer. Um, it's much harder to say, well, what kind of costs are we going to incur to value the customer, right? If you look at a company like Zappos, um, where they truly do yeah. value the customer, um, you know, they say, well, we're willing to uh, have, you know, invest all this money into customer service. And instead of, uh, and, 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 and we're not going to evaluate those customer service people based on the on how fast they can get off the phone. We want them on the phone with our customers as much as possible. So that's clearly a value. Um, so that's really what what helps things endure. I thought one of the most interesting parts of of the book was, at least for me writing it, was uh Towards the end, where I talk about my friend Serja Popovich, mm -hmm. um, and he's talking about uh, in the la in the final days of the Serbian revolution, how they really focused on values. That it wasn't about throwing overthrowing a dictator, and it wasn't about putting these people in off in office. It was about adopting European values, and they put up. Um, billboards all over Belgrade uh, as the new new government took power and basically said, we are watching you now because it wasn't about them. They 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 don't have a mandate. They have an obligation that was about values. And then two paragraphs later, um, I, you know, uh, Irving Vladovsky Berger, who was one of Gerstner's key lieutenants in the IBM revolution in the 1990s said exactly the same thing mm -hmm. right remember he said he said if the gerstner revolution was about a product you know or a technology it would have fizzled out long ago right yeah uh because you know gerstner left in 2002 um before we had smartphones or our, you know technology has has moved on since then but because it was about values because uh, that's what Gerstner was constantly pushing, a shift in values, those values were able, the company was able to evolve as technology in the marketplace ch changed. And what struck me in talking to both of them is how similar um, even their word use was. These two people who had on opposite sides of the world, who've never met, who've lived polar opposite lives um, came to that basic same uh, realization and even expressed it in very similar ways. And, and uh, that just really struck me. So I have kind of two things swirling around in my head um, and one of them leading to a question. One is it makes me really think about for all of us on Launch Street, if we actually took our values and looked at how that turns into actions and investments in our business, whether we are you know, inside a big company or a small company, what that really looks like relative to our values. Do we, if we value taking risks, do we really put time and money behind that? 
Um, right. So, to your so point, if, customers, if, if right? you value taking risks, right, what costs are you willing to incur right. to take risks? Right. I think right? that's a really interesting way to look at it um, and to really the, t- test if you're living your values, because to what you're saying is that for those cascades to happen and to live beyond those short term successes and goals, we've got to really we, we have to actually be living the values in a way that maybe we don't think of. Cause we have a lot of lip service yeah, to living values. Just, yeah. Just just to clarify, a, a yeah. cascade can happen without values. I mean, a, a cascade mm-hmm. can happen if you do nothing. Right. Um, that's what Occupy was about. Um, the cascades, uh, the problem is if if a cascade uh, happens without values or with ha- without that uh, foundation, that underlying yeah. link building, the most likely the cascade will not be your friend. Right. Um, and, and you really need to make that distinction between a moment and a movement, right? Occupy was was really a moment, right? Mm-hmm. They thought it was a movement, but then everybody went home. But then. <laughs> Nothing happened, right? <laughs> right. Um, they, were, they were, the Occupy movement was the beneficiary for a short time of a cascade, but it wasn't so- theirs. Right, right. So let's back up, or let's. I, I want to dig into the science behind it and how you created. And funny enough, what's, what the the business example that keeps coming to my mind as you're talking is Crocs shoes, which is funny because they're right in my backyard, and I'm I just can't stand them. I don't understand why people wear them, but that's that's a whole different conversation. But what's interesting about them to me is they had this huge peak. What was that? Two thousand eight, nine, six, maybe seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there. Like Crocs were everywhere, and then all of a sudden poof, they were gone. And the company was, you know, struggling. And I think they've kind of found a little bit of a niche now. But to me, that was a very like, oh, look at us, we're so successful, but not in the long run. So my question to you around all of that, maybe they're not the right example, but it just, it's it's all of those brands that kind of suddenly pop up and then disappear, pop up and then disappear. They're like the one hit wonders of, of the product world. My question to you is, how do you create a movement? How do you how do you build cascades? And is there a science behind it? Right. There is, let's say there's two parts, right? There's a science and then there is a practice, right? And I, I'd like to go back and talk a little bit about uh, the journey that led to the book. Uh, I don't know whether whether we've discussed this yet, but... Um, In 2004, I was running a major news organization in the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, and I was just amazed how, you know, uh, thousands upon thousands of people who'd ordinarily be doing thousands of different things would all of a sudden stop what they were doing and start doing the same thing all together in unison with no formal coordination and I just thought to myself, gee, I'd really like to be able to do that, right? Because I've got these thousands upon thousands of potential customers buying all these different things. I want them to unify on buying the one thing I want to sell them, right? <laughs> I, you know, and I've got these hundreds of, of, of different employees, and they all have their own ideas. I want them to embrace the initiatives right. that I think are important. How do you so replicate really what's to, happening here? Yeah. Right. Um, and then a few years later, I was in Silicon Valley and uh, everybody, this is 2006, so everybody was talking about social networks. And we also had a major, major digital business. We basically had the, the, the Yahoo.com and the New York Times.com of Ukraine. So I said, this is something I, I should really learn about. And so I started studying up on network theory. And here I found a mathematical explanation for almost everything I didn't understand in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine during the Orange Revolution. So, so that's what sort of started me on my journey. And I talk uh, quite a bit about the science in the book. Um, but it, what it really bo- boils down to is small groups loosely connected united by a shared purpose. So you need these uh, small groups because small groups is, are where we build strong bonds. Um, those loose connections is how, um, how things spread, 
through something called the strength of weak ties. And it's that uh, that shared purpose uh, that um, binds everything together, uh, well, that vision of tomorrow. Before you go on, will you dig in a little bit about – and I, I thought this was a really powerful uh, – comment that I hadn't thought about, in fact, I was thinking differently, about why loose connections build those strong bonds versus what I think we tend to believe, which is it's all about those really deep relationships that I have. Yeah, this is this is sort of an interesting thing, because for decades, um, network, network science has been around for quite a long time, um, since basically graph theory was invented in at the end of the 18th century. Um, and, and generally speaking, there was always this assumption that within a network, you could either have a lot of clustering like this, this really, uh, these, these tight, uh, bonds. Um, you know, you think of like a, uh, a Navy SEAL group, right? Very yeah. highly clustered, right? Um, groups of very highly clustered people. Or you could have uh, short path links, meaning not a lot of degrees of separation between uh, random members in the group, right? And it was it was assumed that those two things were diametrically opposed. But the the at the end of the '90s, in '98 and '99, there were uh, breakthroughs uh, by a team. At Cornell, uh, led by uh, Duncan Watts and uh, Steve Strogatz, and then another one at uh, Notre Dame, uh, uh, led by uh, uh, Albert Laszlo's uh, Barabashi's lab. Um, and basically what they found was that not only could you have a high degree of clustering, as well as... Uh, short, uh, uh, degree, small degrees of, of separation, but that was a natural state. It was a small, now it's called a small world network. Um, so it's not that the, the, this, the, uh, the loose connections build the, the strong bonds. It's that those two things can uh, can not only coexist, they naturally coexist. So if you want to build your m movement, you have to constantly be connecting out. And if you look at, let's say, Occupy uh, is a great example. Um, Occupy, they weren't interested in connecting out. They were interested in purity, right? And if... If you think about the so-called one-hit wonders, why do they fall so quickly? Uh, usually because when they get sh you know, when they shoot up to the top, they don't they're not interested in building connections, right? They're not interested in building stability, right? And and I think it it goes back to you know Michael Porter and his um his ideas about competitive strategy, which have, have, were so influential for the past 30, 40 years. Uh, and it was all about maximizing your bargaining power. Uh, but today, if you maximize your bargaining power with, uh, you know, all the other companies in the value chain, you're going to weaken your links in the ecosystem. And, uh, and, and, and that's why today you see companies sort of scrambling around to build accelerators, to build, you know, internal VC funds. Um, I mean, if you think about Microsoft in the 90s, they were coming for, for everybody's business, right? Um, and, and it really, really hurt them. And now if you look at, well, first of all, look at Microsoft today where they're they're much much more collaborative um you know they used to say uh, linux was a cancer now they say we love linux and they've really embraced open source and that's the way the world has changed and i don't think 
that there's been any huge shift in in human nature. I think it's just that hierarchies are slow and the world has become fast. All right. I am here with Derek, who is the president of Brility. So Derek, your company, Brility, is amazing at helping your clients think and act differently and leverage an experimental mindset to stand out. So how does having an experimental mindset help you do that? Uh, well, thanks, Tamara. Um, I would say the experimental mindset is, a, is essential for uh, long-term success and predictable success. We are all about building a system that is reliable for growth. And to do that, you have to challenge assumptions. The experimental mindset allows us to put our best foot forward, adapt and iterate, and really learn what is causal to work so that we have predictable success. We really are in a dynamic environment right now. Technology is changing, business is changing, and assumptions need to be challenged. So in order to do that, we need to craft careful experiments where we can learn, adapt, and grow. What's the downside of not experimenting? Uh, the, the assumptions. I mean, you see Blockbuster gets wiped out by Netflix. Um, there is a graveyard of companies out there who thought they had it figured out and they marched towards a certain doom because others were out there experimenting and figuring out what works and what doesn't and adapting to the changing marketplace. Amazon runs 10,000 concurrent experiments at once. There's a reason they dominate e-commerce. Google does the same thing. Facebook does the same thing. Wow. So can you share with me one example of how Brility did that for one of your clients? Um, we have a, a, a GIS um, client, which is a type of software that does mapping and locations. They are a small startup, but very, very well funded. And they are going up against a massive incumbent. And they, um, there isn't a current name or explanation for their offering. Uh, it's not commonly searched for or known. And what we what we had to do was run dozens of experiments to see what language at a high level resonated with their audience, which were anywhere from engineers to salespeople uh, to VPs. And um, through that, we really found what surprised us most was not outcome and benefit-based promises, but actual screenshots of the technology, which seemed to uh, immediately and intuitively have the users grasp how it was how it was utilized and there's a shift in the marketplace that people are sick of platitudes and promises they want to see a little bit of how things are done that uh that, those experiments were very revealing and we're doubling down on them for the client now and it's very successful all right launch readers what we need to figure out i know i'm going to go and do right now is figure out where i'm experimenting and where i'm assuming derek thank you so much for coming by thank you well, and I think what's kind of implied too with what you're saying is when you think about your tight networks, um, you know, the ones that you're really close with, you know, that you're in the same network together. And those loose connections are what give you access to new networks and new communities. And you don't have that by staying insular. Absolutely. Absolute great point. And, and, and another point uh, along those lines is that you grow your network uh, through the people you already know, uh, you know, everybody, when you think of networking, usually people think of, you know, that chance meeting on an airplane or going to some networking event. The best way to build your network is through the friends of your friends and their friends. Right. It's like that old, was it Sesame Street? That it's like, they tell two friends and they tell two friends. And suddenly there's like a thousand squares on the screen. I thought that was a shampoo commercial, wasn't it? Was it? I don't know. Yeah, that was a shampoo commercial. You could I think Farrah Fawcett or something. Oh, maybe. Oh, and Joe Namath. Right. Right. Yeah, that was back in the 70s. It's kind of like Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, but in a different way. Right. Um, Right. We're we're really dating ourselves now. I I was talking about my my full Rolodex the other day, and some people listening don't even know what that is. Look it up. You'll know. It was very important back in the day. Um, So – I want to I want to actually dig into one story in your book because you had in what we were just talking about about loose connections and the power of that and that shared purpose, um, which I think you gave a lot of great examples about that and some of the um, historical context that you shared because really ultimately that is what brought all these random people together in the Ukraine right was the shared purpose. Um, but you mentioned change and kind of what's happening in today's world, and I think that there's this underlying current of what you said earlier, which is constant disruption. 
And sometimes we look at companies and we see them get it right. And they jump on board with a disruption or they even create it and, and move forward. And other times they miss the mark. Um, and you and I were having this side conversation before we started this about how we talk about, you know, Netflix versus Blockbuster and Uber versus taxis and, you know, fill in the blank, right? But we don't really share the real story behind it and why, you know, seeing what's happening around you and the, the, this concept of cascades is so important. So all that is to say, will you talk about Netflix? Right. So this is this is such a a great and interesting story that that gives that is so often given short shrift. So the the conventional view was that, uh, you know, Netflix came along, that there was uh, some meeting where uh, they met with the blockbuster executives, the blockbuster executives laughed at them uh, and uh the the leadership of Blockbuster was asleep at the wheel and Netflix just came along and disrupt disrupted them. Um, and um, if you think about it, that's that's not a that's not a very believable story. Right. I, I mean, even that first it, initial meeting with Blockbuster and and Netflix, Netflix was nobody then. Right. Um, You know, they they were hemorrhaging money. They didn't have a business at that point. They hadn't even launched their subscription model yet. They were just trying to sell uh, 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 videos through the mail. Another thing that that gets lost about that that meeting was basically what what was proposed. So what. Netflix proposed at that meeting was that basically the same deal that Toys R Us did with Amazon and was such a disaster for Toys R Us. So that's actually a blockbuster somewhat, you know, first of all, inviting the startup in because they're curious about looking around and B, uh, you know, really dodging a bullet. But what's most interesting is what happened after that. So uh, 2004, the uh, Blockbuster was finally spun off from Viacom. And they really weren't able to make any significant investments before that happened because Viacom wanted to get the very best selling price. Uh, But then that was February 2004 when that spinoff was announced. By um, by the fall of 2004, so just six months later, Blockbuster Online was launched. And then in the beginning of 2005, uh, they ended late fees. It took a couple of more months to do that because they wanted to run some pilot programs to, to make sure that it was a good idea. Um, so... That's so they were in early enough. And then by 2006, um, they completely uh, innovated their business model and came up with something called uh, the total access. Uh, And this basically allowed their customers to use the stores and the the internet kind of interchangeably so that they could rent through the mail and return at the store or 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 rent at a store and return through the mail and it was it was really an offering that netflix couldn't compete with within just two or three weeks um new uh, new subscriber editions shifted from 70 30 in in netflix's favor to about 70 30 in blockbuster's favor within just a few weeks and now netflix was really in trouble so uh it's really an amazing story so then you say well then what happened how did they fail and this is a great example of what we were talking about before uh it it the the blockbuster strategy was really just a strategy. It didn't have anything to do about values. Um, and uh, and because uh, he was unable to manage uh, important stakeholder networks within blockbuster, specifically 
the investors and the franchisees. Uh, the stock took a tumble and uh, and that attracted the corporate raider Carl Icahn to come in. And he was a bit heavy handed. The beginning of, uh, to say the least, the beginning of 2007, uh, he basically calls up the CEO, John Anioko, and he says, hey, we're not paying your bonus this year. And and John, he told me that he was just at a point personally, professionally, um, that he financially, he said, I don't need this anymore. He leaves the company. The new a new uh, CEO comes in, a guy named Jim Keyes. Um, he had apparently some personal animosity toward uh, toward Anioko and you know, just as almost a knee jerk reaction, it seems just wanted to reverse every decision he ever made. Um, yeah. Sounds sort of familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> well, I think and, we actually see that all, not all the time, but it's not uncommon where there's a, a ter territory and ego games that really impact business. Yeah. So he reversed, he reversed almost everything about the strategy. Uh, and uh, three years later, Blockbuster was bankrupt. Yeah. Well, but what I think is so interesting is people think, you know, that is it's such a cautionary tale because we are raised to believe that if we're smart and agile and ambitious and we execute, we're, we're going to succeed. That's those are the rules of success. And here you have, you know, a bunch of really smart, driven guys who executed very, very well um, and they failed because they were unable to drive an idea through their stakeholder networks and get everybody on board and embrace it. And uh, I, I tell the story later on uh, about a more recent story about Experian and their move to, uh, to shift to, to the cloud architecture. Um, and there the CIO, a guy named Barry Libenson, he knew from the get go. He said uh, he came into Experian, he talked to customers, they said what we want more than anything else is real-time data. And he said, well, I know how to fix that problem. Uh, you know, we need to shift to a cloud infrastructure. But he immediately said, there is no way I'm going to push that through, right? So he didn't try, uh, and I think this is one of the uh, one of the big mistakes people make, they immediately want to try and convince people, but, uh, of, of whatever their idea is, but you know, anybody who's ever been married or had kids knows how difficult it can be to change even one person's mind to change hundreds or thousands is, is really a tall order. So what Barry did is instead of trying to go out and convince the skeptics, he, uh, and, and every successful movement in the book uh, that I researched was some form of this. So instead of trying to go convince the skeptics, he went and he gathered around people who were already enthusiastic about the idea. And, uh, and then he, he gave them training and empowered them to bring more people in still. Uh, and then that's what led to what I call a keystone change, which ended up in that case being – a uh, a set of internal APIs. And so he constantly was building momentum and building a movement through those small groups loosely connected. Uh, and that's how they they not only achieved it in in three years, but also build uh, built new business models on top of it and set the stage for a new transformation they're embarking on. Um, in involving artificial intelligence. So that's how they're surviving victory. They're not just stopping at the cloud, but they said, now we can use these same networks that we used to build the first movement to build the next one and the one after that. You know, Greg, one of the things that I think is really brilliant about the stories you're sharing and kind of the, the thought leadership you're bringing to them is as you were telling those, I was thinking to myself, wow, as a leader in whatever I'm doing, and I want to uh, ignite change, I, I want to take us in a new direction, I want to push something forward, whatever it is, that I really should be thinking about, and this is for all of us on Launch Street, thinking about how do I get buy-in from those advocates 
who can then go back to their networks and spread it versus me trying to shove my brilliance onto everybody, which to your point about communication doesn't work, right? It doesn't matter how brilliant it is. It doesn't work when you shove it kind of in this one way format. Um, but how do I, right. really I would even say like you want advocates? to, you want to, you want to focus on how can I, how can I empower the people who, who want the same things I want? Yeah, that's a great way to say it. And I love that concept of that being your first step versus let me make everybody agree with me, which is, I think, where we all kind of tend to play. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's uh, there's a great quote by a a guy named Howard Aiken. He says, uh, don't worry about people stealing your ideas. He says, if your ideas are any good, you'll have to ram, ram them down people's throats. (laughs) which is so true because (laughs) you know um every world changing idea arrives out of context for the simple reason that the world hasn't changed yet so if if you truly have a, a good idea that's new and different you are going to uh you're going to hit a, a, a lot of uh resistance so ca- cascades is really the alternative to trying to ram uh, ideas down people's throats. Well, and that's a very hierarchical approach to your point, which is long and slow and embarks on a lot of resistance versus a network approach. To your point, how do you empower the network around you to then empower their network and so on and so forth? And again, it goes back to our Pantene Sesame commercial of two to four to six to 12, to, you know, whatever the math is. So um, I'm, I'm curious because we've been talking kind of on both sides of the coin, which I love a little bit about success and also about failure. In general, why do so many of us get it wrong? This Because we know we want to create movements. And it's so funny to me, right? Like, I think that sometimes we'll be in conversations and they'll say things like, I want to create a video that goes viral like Dollar Shave Club did. And right. it's just that kind of blanket of a statement. And, and, and that in itself is a wrong approach to it. But when you think about the clients you work with and the world that you see, where are we misstepping that we should fix? Yeah, so so I, I think the answer is inherent in in your question. So it's how can we do this? How can I achieve that? Mm. Um, when successful movements are always about empowering others, right? So mm-hmm. if if uh, if if you think about uh, first, I'm going to give you a an example in the context of of the book. Um, and and then we'll we'll bring it to something a little bit more familiar. But I think one of the starkest examples in in the book was the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004. It was called the Orange Revolution because that was the color of a political candidate's campaign. Ah. And uh, and when he got into office, he proved to be not such a great president um, and the and the movement died. Then in 2013 and 14, it, it was called Euromaidan because it was all about embracing European values. Um, and they brought in a president who also had a uh, who's, who's actually a good guy, um, but certainly had had some serious problems and became very, very unpopular. Um, so in the election just a few weeks ago, he was voted out and there was a pre- peaceful transfer of power and the movement lives on. Hmm. So um, when you think about, uh, you know, great brands or great movements, uh, if you think about Google, you know, we want to help organize the world's information. Um, it's very, even Steve Jobs in his own way, it was never for Steve Jobs, who was a man of extreme arrogance and, and, and in ego, right. But you even got the sense that the one thing that could humble Steve Jobs was the product itself. Yeah. Um, right. So you always want to think about how, a, how can I connect out and how can I empower how can I empower the forces that will help bring about the change that I want to see? What do you think stops people from innovating or maybe even joining the, the movement itself? It, yeah. Um, 
Well, when it comes to to innovating, I well, I think those are two two very different things. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of innovating, this is something I talked about in my first book. Is you know somebody is so often people think that there's one true path to innovation, and they can say, oh, and this is you know this is the way you innovate. This is our innovation DNA. This is what always works for us, and that works for a while until they get a, a they run into a problem that. Um, that doesn't quite fit that solution. Right. And then they just spin their wheels. So you always want to focus on the problem and fitting the a solution to the problem rather than trying to take a solution and make it fit any problem that, that you need to solve. Uh, when it comes to, to movements, um, I think that the, the main reason movements fail is that and 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 I think this is this is an in an, an ex, this gets back into more tactical things but one of the things I talk about in the book is that you're always mobilizing somebody to influence something right and that and that something is almost always an institution so uh you know often I'm I'm asked I'm talking right now to a, a, a major consumer goods company that uh, uh, that wants to uh, transform its research organization. And they told me like, well, you know, how, what do we do with, you know, we have some lab directors who, who just aren't going to go along with it. And then, and I asked them, well, who influences what those lab directors think, right? Because you're not the only source of, of influence on them. I mean, they have a number, right? I mean, there's a number of stakeholder groups. There are business partners. There are customer groups. There is the educational system and universities. There are regulatory uh, uh, agencies. There, there are um, professional societies. So there's all these stakeholders around that you can use to, uh, to build a network. Um, and then you look at something like Occupy, where they didn't want to build connections to anybody, right? Uh, I mean, they... they you know, they didn't want to have anything to do with the two party system. So when the civil rights uh, uh, hero, John Lewis, came to a one of their rallies to support them, they wouldn't let him speak. Mm. Um, so that idea that you always want to be building that network out and you're never just mobilizing people to make noise or, you know, build awareness. You're always mobilizing specific constituencies to influence specific institutions that can that have the power to bring change about. So it, is it ego that keeps us from building those networks? Like why, why would we not? Why would we not do that when it seems so obvious? Well, it's also, um, you know, again, we're talking about small groups and loose connections, right, that, that yeah. help drive the movement. The problem is, is when you want that small group to be too pure, right? Mm, um, yeah. Because, because building those connections to outside groups are going to change your small group in some way, right? It's going to almost like back at school, right? When you have your, you know, your two best friends, you don't want to let anybody in because obviously that's going to change the dynamics. Right. Um, of, um and, and 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 I would say that's the the biggest thing that undermines. Not so much, uh, you know, ego can be a part of it, but that idea that that this idea or this technology or this product or this whatever it is is so pure that it can't mix with anybody else because it'll be tainted in some way. That's the absolute best way to kill an idea. Well, and, and to me, that really speaks to um, an, 
uh, an overly developed need for control as well. Uh, because really, right, we're trying to control the outcome. We're trying to control the message. We're trying to control who's involved. We're trying to, you know, keep it pure to your point. But really, ultimately, what that does is close off the impact we could have. Absolutely. I mean, if 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 you want to have an impact, it can't be about you because everybody right. else wants it to be about them. Right. 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 It's funny. <laughs> we're, we're all about me. That's the hard part. Um yeah, it's funny. I have this running, uh, this thing, and you do a lot of keynoting too, and it's the I, you balance. And I've noticed you get speakers up there who it's like me, 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 I, 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 me, 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 and there's no you. And the audience, it doesn't matter how good the story is, the audience is like, well, what's in it for me? Where do I, like, you, you can't make an impact when you focus on you. You can't be the hero of your own story. And it's kind of that same thing, right? And like your example of Occupy, um, although I'm not, you know, I know what it is and I followed it, but I'm not steeped in it the way you are. But that was very about like, we want to own the message, own the story, own the spotlight, which really is what kind of led him to that cliff at the end where suddenly it was just gone. Yeah. And also, uh, I tell the story in the book about my friend, Sir Ja, who helped lead the Ser- Serbian revolution. He was called in to help them and to train them. Mm-hmm. And he said, so what is it you want to change? And they, they said, well, you know, the student loans and the banks are evil. And the, he said, no, 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 those are grievances. You know, what do you actually mm. want to change? What's your right. vision for tomorrow? He said they went round and round for hours. They couldn't tell him. And then Sir Ja being Sir Ja, he said, and, and what are you sleeping in a park for? Don't you know bankers have air conditioning? They don't care where you sleep. <laughs> He said, they're just going to wait you out. Um, and, and, and that you see a lot of as well, that not only do people uh, want uh, purity, but they, uh, they insist on that type of dedication, that people show some sacrifice to join their movement. Right. And they want that kind of dedication. And, and they feel anybody who isn't the purest of pure doesn't belong. And that's mm. another great way to kill an idea. And the, so true uh, in business too, right? Like when you, when it's about you and, and keeping it pure, really those ideas tend to not go anywhere because to what you were saying earlier, nobody wants your, your brilliance pushed on them like that. Right. And, and uh, just more on the sort of scientific note, uh, there's fabulous studies by uh, two academics, uh, Erica Chenoweth and, and Maria Stepan, which shows that the most uh, important factor in whether a, a uh, revolutionary movement succeeds or fails is participation. Mm, because right. before you can have commitment, you first need participation. Um, so you want to be inviting people in, not, you know, administering some sort of purity test. And even, you know, uh, companies, if you look at Google, has really, really learned that over the years. You know, it, it used to be a hacker's, you know, a, a coder's coder's company, right? right. You, they, they gave all those tests and everything else. And then they realized uh, over time that, you know, other skills are important, too. Uh, and to grow and, and to, to continue to scale, they had to change what was a very important part of Google's ethos. And it's a much better company for it. So I can't believe how long we've been talking because I could keep going. But before I have to close us, where can people go to learn more, get the book, connect with you? So uh, best two places are gregsatel.com um, and uh, digitaltonto.com. Okay. I, and I have to say for um, us launch treaters, the book is – I actually read the whole book, like start to finish without kind of stopping, which is unlike me in general. I tend to have little attention issues when it comes to reading. But it's just so readable. And I mean that as the highest compliment because I, I think there's a lot of business books in particular that we I read that are a slog. And I'm like, whoa. And then I have to do the work of figuring out why this is relevant to me. Um, and that's exhausting. And this your book, you just, Greg, you do a phenomenal job of just putting it in a way that's 
understandable to those of us reading who have not spent the years doing the research but need to do something with that information. So, so for launch readers, really go go buy the book. Um, my last question for you is, what is your one piece of advice for those of us looking to ignite a movement? What, what's one thing we just we have to walk away from this podcast thinking about? That uh, I would say that it's all about connecting out. As long as you continue to invite people in and to connect people out, uh, you're you, you can't go too far wrong. It's awesome advice, Greg. Thank you so much for coming back and joining us. Um, we'll put a link to both books in the show notes, um, right. but they're they're both fantastic, as we know from our last conversation, and it was. It was great to dig into some of this. It was it's it's just so helpful to really think very differently about the hierarchy environment we used to be in versus the network environment. And I think for those of us Gen X and above, we really have to uh, look in the mirror and ask ourselves if we're making that switch in how we work. Well, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. I found that so interesting, didn't you? And I know we talked a lot about political movements and and protest type stuff, but I want you to consider that that has a lot to do with your business. I mean, if you look at how someone can rally people like that, can get them behind their cause, get them to take action, those are the lessons that we need in business. And that's what creating a movement is all about. So I hope you saw how valuable that was and how what we were talking about really relates to your world. Like I said, my call to action to you this time is a little bit different. I want you to email me and tell me how your ability to innovate, your IQE, your innovation advantage, how that shows up in your work. And like I said, if you haven't taken the assessment, just go to our website, go to launchroot.com, G-O-T-O, launchroot.com, and take the assessment. But I want to talk to the people, by the way, that have both of their power triggers. If you take the free level on our assessment, that is a great start for you. But I need to know your two power triggers. Those are for people who purchase the full report and insights in action. You're the ones I need to talk to for my upcoming book. But shh, I'm not allowed to say more about the book. All right. Tamara, out. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Lawn Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Lawn Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.